Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you to this session on human immunodeficiency virus. Now, human immunodeficiency virus is an etiological agent of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, commonly known as AIDS. AIDS is the most important uh, public health problem of 21st century. Human immunodeficiency virus, it attacks the cells of immune system and destroys them and makes the body vulnerable to the opportunistic pathogens and malignancies. So, this session is on HIV virus and the objectives for this session are like this. At the end of the session, you will have historical perspective and you will know about the origin of the virus. You will able to describe the classification of virus, its structure and replication of human immunodeficiency virus. You will able to describe the epidemiology of virus, its transmission and pathogenesis, the natural history of HIV infection, laboratory diagnosis of HIV infection and treatment. AIDS was first recognized in 1981. A sudden increase was observed in very uncommon diseases till then like pneumocystis gyrovesi pneumonia and malignancy like Kaposi's sarcoma in young homosexuals and IV drug users. It was observed that these cases had developed profound immunosuppression and had become susceptible to opportunistic infections. In 1983, Luke Montagnier and his colleagues from Pasteur Institute of Paris isolated a virus from the patient with persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. They named this virus as lymphadenopathy associated virus or LAV. In the next year, in USA, a similar virus was isolated from cases of acquired immunodeficiency and this was named as HTLV-3. Subsequently, it was observed that both these viruses were same and hence International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses name these as human immunodeficiency virus. It is believed that HIV in humans originated from cross species infections by simian viruses in rural Africa, probably due to direct contact of human with simian blood. It is believed that this transmission must be occurring in past for several years, but because of social and behavioral changes that happened in 20th century, repeated transmission was possible and the virus was able to cause epidemic in human beings. Now coming to classification of human immunodeficiency virus. Now this virus belongs to a family retroviridae. The retroviridae family, viruses belonging to this family, they possess enzyme which is known as reverse transcriptase. Now usually transcription occur from DNA to RNA, but this enzyme reverse transcriptase can cause transcription in reverse direction that is RNA to DNA. Now the HIV virus, it belongs to uh, genus lentivirus, lentivirus means slow virus that is uh, the incubation period is uh, long and symptoms become apparent after a very long duration of infection. Two species have been identified of HIV virus that is human immunodeficiency virus 1 and HIV 2. Now HIV 1 is the most pre predominant of the two and it is seen all over the world whereas HIV 2 is mostly confined to West Africa and cases have also been reported from India. Because of the 
high mutability seen in HIV virus, uh, different groups and subtypes have been identified. HIV 1 virus has been classified into groups M, O, N and P. Most of the HIV virus fall into group M that is major. Those who do not fall in M such strains or they are classified in HIV O. Those who which do not belong to M and O, they fall into group N. And recently, few distinct groups have been identified which are categorized as group P. Now, HIV 1 group M is the most predominant one and it has been further subtyped as A to K. Now, out of these, A is seen mostly in West Africa it is most common. B is seen Europe, Japan, Australia and North America. C is in India, the predominant subtype observed is C. Now, if a cell is simultaneously infected with multiple subtypes, then recombination can occur and uh, forms which are known as circulating recombinant forms have been identified. HIV 2 is also classified into subtypes A to H out of which A is common. Now, HIV 2 is much less pathogenic as compared to HIV 1 and when we compare HIV 1 and HIV 2 only 40 percent antigenic homology is seen between these two viruses. Let us see the structure of HIV virus. HIV virus is an enveloped virus about 150 nanometer in size. There are two identical copies of single stranded RNA present in the core. The core is surrounded by a capsid which is icosahedral capsid and it is cone shaped. Outside the capsid there is a matrix protein. Besides this, the nucleocapsid is also associated with various enzymes like reverse transcriptase, integrase and proteinase etcetera. So, HIV virus is an enveloped virus. The envelope is formed when uh, this virus bursts out from the host cell. So, the lipid part of the envelope it is derived from the host cell. Now, there are two important antigenic components which are present on the HIV envelope. One is GP120, GP stands for glycoprotein, 120 is the molecular weight. So, two antigenic components are part of the envelope, GP120 which is a globular forms which spike out on the surface of the virus and GP41 which forms transmembrane pedicle. Now, these two components of the envelope are very important for the attachment of the virus to the host cell. So, GP120 and GP41 they are involved in the attachment and entry of the virus in the host cell. Now, HIV has genome which consists of two positive strands of RNA which are identical in nature. There are total 9 genes present of which 3 are structural genes and 6 uh, are non-structural genes. Now, the 3 structural genes are GAG which codes for the structural prote proteins, POL which codes for the viral enzymes and envelope which codes for the envelope proteins. Besides these structural genes, there are other genes also which are known as regulatory genes. So, there are 6 regulatory genes present and the products or proteins coded by these genes, they are involved in replication and they are also responsible for infectivity and the pathogenicity of the virus. Now, it is important to understand the various products of these genes because these products, they are used for the diagnosis of HIV virus infection. So, HIV gene, ENV gene, it uh, codes for the products like uh, uh, GP160, GP120, GP41. 
So, 160, 120 and 41, these are the molecular weights, these are the envelope glycoproteins. Protein part is coded by ENV gene. There is precursor GP160, which splits into GP120 and GP41 by protease enzyme. Pole gene, it codes for reverse transcriptase and endonucleases. The products of GAG gene are core protein P24. Now, this P24 product of uh, this GAG gene is very, very important because it helps in the detection of these antigen, helps in the diagnosis of HIV infection. So, besides P24, the other two proteins are P20, P55 and P17. Now, let us see the how this virus replicates. Now, the virus gets attached to the host cell by means of two antigens that is GP120 and GP41 which are present, which are part of the envelope. Now, these get attached, the receptor for these antigens are the CD4 molecules. Now, CD4 molecules are predominantly present on the T helper lymphocytes. And besides T helper lymphocytes, there are other cells like B cells, macrophage, macrophages, they also and even glial cells in the brain, they also uh, show presence of CD4 molecules uh, in small amount. But basically, the, the virus gets attached to the CD4 T lymphocytes because the receptor for this is C, uh, CD4 molecule. Besides CD4 molecule, two co-receptors that is CCXR4 and CCR5 are the two co-receptors, they are also required for the attachment of the virus. Now, after attachment of the virus by means of GP120 and 41 to the cell membrane on CD4 receptor, the binding and fusion occurs and the virus nucleic acid it is released in the cytoplasm of the host cell. In the cytoplasm of the host cell, with the help of reverse transcriptase enzyme, a complementary DNA is pro produced from the viral RNA. The complementary DNA, it gets converted into double-stranded DNA. The RNA part is lysed. This double-stranded DNA, now it enters the nucleus and it gets integrated with the help of integrase enzyme in the host chromosome. Now, this integrated part, it is known as provirus. Now, this provirus, now ready for transcription. So, multiple copies of uh, RNA and mRNA is produced. mRNA codes for the various proteins like structural proteins and non-structural proteins of uh, HIV virus. And finally, assembly and maturation takes place and virus is released from the host cell by process of body. Now, let us see the pathogenesis of HIV virus. Now, the cardinal feature of HIV infection is depletion of CD4 lymphocytes. Now, we have seen that HIV virus, it gets attached to the CD4 molecule which are present on the T helper lymphocytes. Now, the virus enters and uh, ultimately destroys these cells, the result is there is depletion of CD4 T lymphocytes. Now, we know that CD4 T lymphocytes play a very critical role in immune response. It plays important role in cell mediated immune response as well as humoral immune response. So, destruction of these cells results in the depression of immune system and the body becomes vulnerable to the infections which are usually not common. I mean, uh, it, the body becomes vulnerable to the infections by opportunistic uh, organisms. Uh, other cells like monocytes and macrophages, they are usually involved in the dissemination of the virus to the various organs including brain. Now, how this virus is transmitted in the body? The most important mode or root of transmission is sexual mode that is heterosexual intercourse is the most important mode of transmission. The virus is also transmitted by transmission of infected blood and blood products. 
or transplantation of infected tissue. It is also transmitted from mother to her infant and the transmission can occur in utero or during labor or it can also be transmitted during breastfeeding because the virus is secreted in breast milk. Besides this, the virus can be transmitted by contaminated needles. So, if there is a needle stick injury, there are chances of transmission of this virus and also sharing of needles by IV drug addicts is again one of the important modes of transmission of virus. One has to remember that these are the only modes of transmission of HIV virus. HIV is not at all transmitted by casual contact. So, it is not transmitted by uh, kissing or by hugging, it is not transmitted by insect bite or sharing utensils and uh, uh, some casual contact. So, because of this peculiar mode of transmission of HIV virus, certain group of people they become more vulnerable to infection. So, such groups of people they are known as high risk groups. So, sex workers both male as well as female sex workers are important risk groups. People with multiple sex partners, homosexuals that is men having sex with men, IV drug addicts healthcare workers and recipients of blood and blood products are the important high risk groups for HIV infection. Now, let us see what are the risks of transmission associated with the different routes of transmission of HIV virus. Now, blood transmission in blood transmission the risk of transmission is 90 to 95 percent. However, though the risk of transmission is very high, this is the least frequent mode of transmission of HIV virus. During sexual intercourse, there are 0.1 to 1 percent chances of transmission. In injection drug abusers, there are 0.5 to 1 percent chances, needle stick exposure 0.3 percent chances and mother to child approximately 30 percent chances of transmission of HIV virus. Now, let us see the natural history of HIV infection. Now, the natural history means if there is no intervention, therapeutic intervention, what will be the course of infection that is known as natural history of the course uh, of a disease. So, let us see the natural history of HIV infection. Now, uh, after infection, the incubation period is it is said to be 6 to 6 days to 6 weeks, but average incubation period is 3 to 6 weeks. So, after at the end of the incubation period about 50 to 70 percent of the individuals they uh, develop an illness which is known as acute retroviral syndrome. Then this syndrome it lasts for about 7 to 14 days and it is followed by an illness which is totally asymptomatic uh, which is known as latent period. So, during latent period the infected person is totally asymptomatic that is why it is known as latent period. Now, this period where there is clinical latency the person is totally asymptomatic it lasts for about 8 to 10 years and after that again there is development of symptoms and subsequently there is development of immunodeficiency and this phase is known as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So, we can classify the natural history or divide into three phases acute retroviral syndrome which may not always be apparent which is seen only in 50 to 70 percent of individuals infected individuals which is followed by latent period a very long duration may be about 8 to 10 years and then again there is appearance of symptoms and development of opportunistic infection and the end stage of HIV infection results in acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is the last stage or last phase of HIV infection. Now, what happens in acute retroviral syndrome? So, in acute retroviral syndrome the virus actively multiplies and large number of copies of RNA they can be found in the plasma. So, up to 100 million copies of RNA can be seen 
uh, to be present in the plasma. Now there occurs extensive destruction of CD4 T lymphocytes. So, if you make the counts of CD4 T lymphocytes, you will find there is depletion of CD4 T lymphocytes. Now there is widespread dissemination of virus and some HIV specific markers they can be found in the blood. So, the first important marker to appear in the blood is HIV RNA. This is followed by an important antigen that is core antigen P24 antigen. Then the first antibody to appear is HIV1 IgM and at the end of the acute retroviral syndrome the antibody to appear is HIV IgG antibody. After about 2 to 3 weeks there is resolution of this uh, primary infection and there occurs decline in the plasma viral load. So, there is decline in viremia. The CD4 counts again they become normal because there is some restoration of the immune system. Immune response become it is restored to some extent. So, CD4 count it becomes it again increases and viral plasma viremia it declines and it comes to a level which is known as viral set point. So, this is what occurs during acute retroviral syndrome. A very high level of plasma levels of RNA plasma levels are found. By the time of the resolution the levels they decline and they come to a point which is known as viral set point. So, it is not the virus is not totally removed or it is not the cured of it persists in the lymph node and it multiplies continuously and during cl clinical latency though there are no signs and symptoms, but virus still multiplies in the body and by the end of the clinical latency the level starts increasing gradually. So, again there is increase in the titers of the RNA plasma. Now, let us see the time course of the appearance of various markers of HIV. Now, the antibodies they take some time to appear though HIV RNA and P24 antigen they appear early the appearance of IgM it takes some time. So, the duration after infection and the time required for appearance of IgM that period is known as window period. So, during window period you are not able to diagnose HIV infection by detecting antibodies. So, that period is known as window period. So, the HIV RNA usually it is seen after 10 days of infection, P24 antibodies can be detected after 14 days of infection approximately. HIV IgM antibodies they take about 20 days to appear and HIV IgG antibodies they take 30 to 60 days to appear. So, IgM antibodies they take about 20 days. So, before that it is not possible to diagnose HIV infection by antibody detection and that period is known as window period and during window period the infection can be diagnosed by detecting HIV RNA or by P24 antigen. Let us see what happens to CD4 counts. So, during acute retroviral period there is depletion of CD4 lymphocytes. When this phase resolves there is again increase in the CD4, but they never come to normal level and then there is a gradual decline in the CD4 T cells because virus is continuously multiplying and destroying the CD4 T cells. So, when the, these CD4 T cells they go below 200 the opportunistic infections they start developing because of the decline in the immunity of the body. Now, this coincides with the uh, appearance of symptoms and signs of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Now, during clinical latency it is the period from the initial infection to the development of the clinical immunodeficiency disease. Now, usually in untreated patients the median interval is 10 years. In rapid progressors the there are certain groups of I mean persons where the progression is very fast they are known as rapid progressors and the AIDS can develop in 1 to 2 years. There are 
certain uh, population who are known as long term non progressors where the they remain symptom free for more than 20 years and there are certain people a very small percentage less than 0.5 percent who are known as elite controllers where they are able to maintain very low levels of virus which is undetectable and they are known they are elite controllers. Now WHO has defined I mean the different stages and accordingly the HIV infection can be divided into different stages that is clinical stage 1 to 4. Now clinical stage 1 it is coincides with the asymptomatic HIV infection sometimes associated with persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. Clinical stage 2 of WHO classification it is characterized by weight loss which is less than 10 percent. There are, there are recurrent respiratory infections and uh, infections, viral infections like herpes zoster, angular chilitis and recur recurrent oral, oral ulcers and there can also be fungal infections like nail infections. Clinical stage 3, it is characterized by severe loss of weight that is which is more than 10 percent. There is chronic diarrhea and fever of duration more than one month at this phase also shows uh, infections like oral hairy leukoplakia, pulmonary tuberculosis and severe bacterial infection. The clinical stage 4, it is coincides with AIDS and it is characterized by various opportunistic infections. HIV wasting syndrome is also known as slim disease where the weight, uh, weight loss is more than 10 percent, fever and diarrhea are of one month duration. There are various bacterial opportunistic infections like extrapulmonary tuberculosis or non-tubercular uh, mycobacterial infections and recurrent septicemia, viral opportunistic infections, fungal opportunistic infections and parasitic opportunistic infections. Malignancies like Kaposi's carcinoma and lymphoma they are also seen during this phase. Now let us see the epidemiology of HIV infection. The global prevalence of HIV infection is about 0.8 percent. Since the uh, advent of this disease or since the discovery of this disease nearly 79 million people have been infected and almost 50 percent of these infected people have been died. The maximum prevalence of HIV infection is observed in Africa. In India the HIV prevalence is about 0.27 percent. Nearly 20 lakh people are now living with HIV or AIDS in India. The more prevalence is seen in states like Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra and sir, some northeastern states like Manipur and Nagaland. Now let us come to the laboratory diagnosis. The laboratory diagnosis of HIV infection is done for various purposes. It could be for the screening of HIV for high risk persons uh, like uh, blood donors or IV drug users, pregnant women, then organ donors. So it could be done for screening. Then diagnosis of symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, persons, monitoring of disease progression and response to ART and if there is percutaneous exposure then before starting post exposure prophylaxis uh, the diagnosis has to be done. Now one has to remember that HIV positivity is associated with various uh, moral, ethical, social and behavioral issues. That is why one has to remember that HIV testing has to be done always with pre-test counseling and post-test counseling so that the patient is prepared to cope with the results of the test and he is able to share the result with the spouse and the family. One has to take consent always in a written format and confidentially has to be maintained to protect the person from victimization, discrimination and stigmatization. So the report is never handed over to anybody but the patient uh, himself or the person authorized by the patient or it can be handed over only to the clinician. Now coming to the laboratory diagnosis of HIV and AIDS. Now the laboratory diagnosis it can be achieved by various methods like virus culture 
antigen detection, antibody detection, molecular tests and non-specific tests. Now, virus culture is not very easy, but it can be done by co-cultivation of patients peripheral blood monocytes with the peripheral blood monocytes obtained from a uninfected individual. And the culture has to be done for 6 weeks and culture medium it is supplemented with interleukin 2. The growth of virus in the culture is detected by activity of reverse transcriptase enzyme and it can also be detected by presence of P24 antigen. Because virus isolation is not very easy, it is usually not done for diagnostic purpose and it is done only in research laboratories. The other, other method of diagnosis is detection of P24 antigen. P24 antigen is a core antigen. Now, this antigen becomes demonstrable in 1 to 2 weeks of infection. However, it does, does not remain or it does not persist in the uh, blood and hence it cannot be demonstrated after that time because it combines with the antibodies which are developed by that time and immune complexes are formed. So, it lasts only for about 3 to 4 weeks. It is also elevated during last stage of HIV infection and can also be detected during that period. So, the P24 assay is useful for confirmation of diagnosis. It can also be used for diagnosis during window period because antibodies cannot be detected during this period and it also for diagnosing the last stage of HIV infection. The detection of antibodies is the mainstay of diagnosis of HIV infection. Antibody detection is rapid and economical, hence commonly used for, for HIV diagnosis. The most patients identified by antibody test, they are in latent phase because during acute retroviral syndrome, antibodies are not produced. So, antibody test, the patients are usually in latent phase. The most important limitation is antibody detection is not possible during window period. And uh, depending upon the type of antigen used for antibody detection, the antibody detection assays, they are grouped into different generations. So, four generation of antibody assays are defined or described first, second, third and fourth depending upon the type of antigen used for assay. So, for example, in the first gener generation assay, viral lysate is used. However, the first generation assays, they are no longer used. Then there are second and third generation assays which use antigens which are synthetically prepared that is synthetic peptide and recombinant antigens. And the fourth generation assays, when in these assays, P24 antigen detection is also possible. So, these are the various generation of antigen antibody assays are available. Now, for antibody detection, the various tests available are enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, rapid tests like immunochromatography and immunoconcentration and simple tests like particle agglutination assay and deep stick or comb tests. When the test is positive by these tests, when the sample is positive by these tests that is ELISA or rapid test or simple test, they are to be confirmed by confirmatory test which are known as supplemental test. So, the supplemental test use are western blot assay and P24 core antigen detection. Sometimes these rapid test of different principle can also be used as a supplemental test. Enzyme linked immunosorbent assay is the most commonly performed assay for detection of HIV antibodies. The assay can be performed when large number of samples to be tested in the laboratory. The principle is simple, it consists of an either antigen or antibody which is attached to a solid phase and it is reacted with an antibody enzyme conjugate and substrate detection system. And the reaction is or the test is read uh, is observed as a change in color and it, it is uh, observed as a uh, it is recorded as a optical density using ELISA reader. There are different types of ELISA's uh, 
developed depending upon the principle and the different types are indirect ELISA, competitive sandwich and capture ELISA all can be used for de detection of HIV antibodies. This is ELISA micro titer plate which is used to perform ELISA test. So, number of samples can be performed at one time. The optical density is read in a machine known as ELISA reader. The most important limitation of ELISA test is that, that different types of or multiple reagents are required for the test and again uh, a skilled or technical expertise is required for performing the test. The other tests available for antibody detection are rapid diagnostic tests. The rapid diagnostic tests are so called because they can be performed quickly and the results are available within 30 minutes. So, they are easier to perform and rapid. They do not require additional equipments like ELISA and they can also be performed on capillary blood. So, phlebotomy by venipuncture is not required. Two types of uh, rapid tests are available immunoconcentration and lateral flow assay. The immunoconcentration assay also known as flow through or dot blot assay. The, the test system is available in cassette for format and it consists of nitrocellular membrane which is coated at three regions HIV 1 antigen, HIV 2 antigen and human anti IgG immunoglobulin. The sample flows vertical, vertically through the nitrocellulose membrane and it reacts with the antigen which is present on the nitrocellulose membrane and the protein A conjugate which is present in the buffer it binds with the antibody and gives pinkish color. So, pink color spots indicate positive test. So, these this is control which is positive and this sample it is positive for HIV 1 antibodies. Another type of rapid assay is immunogrammatographic assay or lateral flow assay. So, basically the principle is same. The only thing is that the reaction is observed in the form of band instead of spot. Besides rapid assay, other simple assays are also available for detection of antibodies. They, they require slightly more time as compared to rapid assays that is 30 minutes to 2 hours. Two types of assays are available agglutination assay and indirect solid phase immuno assays. So, in particle agglutination assay antigen is coated on a carrier particle like uh, RBC or latex particle and it reacts with antibody and the antigen antibody reaction is observed as clumps. The second simple assay commonly used is comb assay where the, the device is like a comb with projections and each projection or tooth of a device is coated with HIV 1 antigen, HIV 2 antigen and anti immunoglobulin G as a control. The test is based on the enzyme immunoassay principle. For the test which are positive by rapid or simple assays, they are confirmed using supplemental assays and the most commonly used supplemental test is western blot test. In western blot test the various HIV specific antigens synthetic or recombinant they are uh, blotted onto a nitrocellulose paper and these separated antigens they are reacted with patient serum. So, antigen antibody complex is formed which is detected by enzyme substrate detection system like ELISA. So, this test is used as a confirmatory test. Now, coming to nucleic acid test. Basically, nucleic acid test they are used for two purpose. One is qualitative, to qualitative detection of nucleic acid during window period because diagnosis by antibody detection is not possible during this period and second is quantitative HIV 1 RNA detection for monitoring the disease progression. Now, two types of assays are available, one is target amplification and second is signal amplification. In target amplification assays, reverse transcriptase PCR or RT-PCR, real time PCR 
and nucleic acid sequ sequence based amplification assays are available. And signal amplification assay includes branch, cha branch chain DNA technique. The non specific test which is used for disease monitoring is CD4 counts. So, the CD4 count counts are important parameter for monitoring HIV disease progression and also it is useful for monitoring efficacy of antiretroviral treatment. The various non-specific tests include counts of CD4 and CD4 CD8 ratio. Now the CD4 T lymphocyte counts they are important parameter for monitoring HIV disease progression and monitoring efficacy of antiretroviral treatment. The CD4 counts they are done using flow cytometry test. Now for HIV testing and interpretation of HIV test results, the National AIDS Control Organization has developed certain strategies. Now the different strategies are to be used depending upon the prevalence of the group from which a person belongs. So the type of testing it depends upon the, the type of strategy used it depends upon the purpose of testing. So four different algorithms or strategy are devised by NACO. In strategy one the specimen is subjected to only one test and this type of strategy is used for screening blood donors. So, if the test is positive, the if the test is reactive, sample is reactive and the blood unit is discarded. So, this is strategy 1. The strategy 2, it is used for epidemiological purpose or for, for zero prevalence studies. So, two tests are performed. If the second test is negative, then the sample is considered as negative and discarded. The strategy 2B, it is used for the diagnosis of symptomatic patient. So the positive result of the first test, they are confirmed by the second test. If the second test is negative, then third test is done. And if the third test is neg negative, then the result is con considered as indeterminate. And it has to be confirmed by supplemental test. Strategy 3, it is used for asymptomatic HIV patient. So, positive the result of first test is confirmed by second and third test and if all the three tests are reactive then only it is reported as positive. So, the results if the results are inter, indeterminate for strategy 2B and 3 then sample are sent for confirmation by supplemental test or by nucleic acid assays. Now coming to diagnosis of HIV in infants or in children less than 18 months. Now because antibodies are passively transferred from mother to a baby, the detection of antibody is not useful for diagnosis of infection of HIV in children below 18 months. The antibodies are also transferred from breast milk uh, to, in, to from, from the infected breast milk to infant. These antibodies persist up to 18 months after birth, hence antibody detection assays cannot be performed for diagnosis. So the best test used are nucleic acid test and DNA PCR is the most commonly performed test for diagnosis of HIV infection below 18 month old children. Now coming to the treatment, there is no permanent cure available for HIV infection. However, highly effective antiretroviral drugs are available and the objectives of antiretroviral treatment are it is used to arrest the progression of the disease to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So the progression from latent phase to AIDS can be prevented by heart uh, that is highly active antiretroviral treatment to reduce the viral load as far as possible to reduce the transmission of HIV for example to reduce the or to arrest the transmission of HIV from mother to baby, to prolong the life of infected person and to improve the quality of the life of infected person. A number of antiretroviral drugs are available. So the drugs available are nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, 
nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor and non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor and there are also protease inhibitors available for the treatment. The treatment the regime used is known as HART or highly active antiretroviral treatment which use two NRTIs and one NNRTI. For prophylaxis of HIV, the effective vaccine is not yet available. This is because of the high mutability of the HIV virus. Also the HIV virus it gets integrated in the human genome and the immune system is not able to clear the HIV infection even after development of the antibodies and immune response. Besides this, there is no suitable animal model is available and also human volunteers are not available because of the various ethical issues involved in the uh, carrying out the trials. So, vaccine is not yet available. However, if there is exposure to HIV virus, then post exposure prophylaxis is available which is a short duration treatment with antiretroviral drug. So, it is recommended for those healthcare workers who are exposed to HIV during healthcare because of the injury due to infected sharp like needle stick. So, the decision to start PEP it depends upon two factors the extent of injury that is whether injury uh, exposure is of a uh, mucosal surface or the skin which is non intact. So, depending upon that and the HIV status of the source. So, depending upon these two things the decision whether to start post exposure prophylaxis or not is taken. The post exposure prophylaxis has to be started within 2 hours of exposure, but if it is not possible then PP should be given before 72 hours. So, the two regimens are available basic regimen and expanded regimen. Again the regimen depends upon the extent of injury and HIV status of the source. And this treatment for prophylaxis, this uh, uh, regime for post exposure prophylaxis is taken for 4 weeks. Now, since cure is not available, available prevention of HIV becomes of uh, very important. So, screening of all blood and blood products is extremely uh, important. So, it is mandatory to screen all blood and blood products for prevention of HIV transmission. During healthcare, it is essential to follow standard precautions and each and every blood sample is considered as a potential source of HIV virus. Education, health education is very important and awareness regarding the self, safe sex practices is required. Then identification of all other sexually transmitted infections and their treatment is required because other sexually transmitted infections they facilitate transmission of HIV infection. And then application of comprehensive parent uh, to child transmission of uh, HIV infection that is vers uh, vertical uh, transmission of HIV infection for from mother to baby it is very important. So, application of comprehensive PPT CT is essential for prevention of HIV transmission because during labor or during pregnancy there are 20 to 40 percent of chances of transmission of infection from mother to baby. So, this was about uh, HIV uh, uh, virus, its pathogenesis, uh, clinical course and laboratory diagnosis. So, to summarize we can say that HIV 1 and HIV 2 are etiologic agents of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, HIV are retroviruses, HIV 1 is the most prevalent type, HIV infection can be divided in, into three phases, acute retroviral phase, latent phase and acquired, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. The heterosexual route is the most common route of transmission, demonstration of antibody is the mainstay of diagnosis. P24 antigen detection is useful for diagnosis during window period. Infant diagnosis of HIV can be done 
using nucleic acid testing like DNA PCR test. NACO guidelines are to be used for uh, testing and interpretation. Treatment is available in the form of uh, ac uh, highly active antiretroviral treatment. There is no permanent cure possible and effective vaccine is not yet available for the prevention of or prophylaxis of HIV. Thank you.